Hello, I'm Mr. Johnston, and this is Biology. Welcome to section 1.5. Uh, during this section, we're going to talk about the principles of biology, is what your uh, textbook calls it. But the basic idea is we're going to talk about four of the main ideas or theories that are ultimately going to work together to kind of drive life as we know it, to allow life to evolve, to allow the things that we see in life to come about as we see them now. Uh, it allows us to kind of predict what's going to happen. It allows us to understand how things work. So as we look at this, what we're going to see is that we have these controlling ideas and the four controlling ideas are going to be cell theory and we've discussed that one before gene theory homeostasis and evolution when you blend all these guys together it lets you understand how we have the diversity of life that we have now which means that within a species you can see that there's all this variation you know there's no two people that are alike even identical twins there's some minor differences but in general like in our classroom you look around and there's diversity you can also see that if you look around, you can see lots of different species. So you might just in your neighborhood see dogs, cats, hamsters, rats and mice, possibly pets, possibly not, uh, lots of insects, squirrels, rat, all this stuff. So we see this whole diversity of life, and that's just animals, not to mention all the bacteria, the plants, the algae. And so these things kind of explain how it is we get those things, how they interact and why things kind of end up the way that they do in many cases. You know, why one thing might go extinct, why when the environment changes, uh, some organisms can manage to pull through and, and survive okay, and other ones can't. So looking at this more, cell theory we've brought up before, so I'll be quick. Just remember, cells make cells. Some of you guys had some difficulty with that. Uh, and as I said before, the cell theory is not really going to work upon where the first cell came from. So don't worry about that. That would be outside of this purview, if you will. We're just going to focus on the fact that cells make cells. That's how we get cells. Typically, one of the cells gets big enough that it can divide, and so ultimately we end up with just two smaller cells. And there's a perfectly simple process that we see all the time. Uh, and then all living things are made of cells. So if you want to wonder how something works, why it works, it's because of the cell or the cells that they possess and the capabilities of that cell or those cells that they possess. Because different cells can do different things based upon uh, essentially what's inside of them. And when we start talking about what's inside of them, that comes right into the gene theory. Where when we look at organisms, which is going to be one or more cells, they're going to have these genes, these, these, as you can see down here, pieces of DNA. Uh, when you look at chromosomes, you know, those long pieces of DNA you'll see, it's going to have like a specific spot. So that particular gene is going to be a segment of DNA in like that one particular location on the chromosome. And so these genes are ultimately what will code for proteins. All right, that's their job, is they say make this protein. And the proteins that we have are what control us. The proteins are our pigments. The proteins control what we can break down when we eat it. Uh, the proteins control what we can build. So once we get energy from breaking stuff down, our food, it controls what things we can build from that. Uh, so really, all the stuff that's in our body, many of our structures, uh, cartilage, bone, a lot of that stuff's going to come down to these proteins. So your genes are going to be one of the things that's inside the cell, and they're going to be critical at determining what type of cell you are and what you're capable of, because they'll ultimately control these proteins. Now, even more than that, these genes are passed on to your offspring. Now, if it's asexual, where you make like a copy or a clone of yourself, they get all your genes. So they get, for better or worse, whatever you had. Now, if it's sexual reproduction, uh, like humans, you're going to have where they get half of your genes and they get half of the other parent's genes. And so based upon exactly which half you give and which half they give, you can get variety right there because there's not always getting like the exact same genes from the exact same parents. So each child that's born is going to have a slightly different mix of the parent's genes. And so that means they'll have a slightly different mix of proteins which means they'll function, they'll have slightly different capabilities. It could mean they're taller, it could mean that they've got different uh, texture or color of hair, it could be their skin tone is different. There's all kinds of stuff that can be different between the individuals because it all comes back to these genes. That's what's inside of our cells that gives us the abilities, uh, good or bad, 
that we have. So now that we know kind of how we can pass on our information, we've got this idea that for us to survive to the point that we can try to actually go through and reproduce, we have to remember our, our whole thing, survival and sex. So for us to get to the sex part, we have to survive. And because the environment is constantly changing, you might get up and it's 60 degrees out and you're cold and you put on pants and a jacket and then later on it's 95 and you're peeling off everything you can because you got sweat dripping off you. We have to be able to maintain our body temperature. We have to maintain enough water within our body so we can get by despite the fact that at some points we might be getting water as we're drinking or whatever else or losing water as we're sweating despite the fact that sometimes we're cold, sometimes we're hot. And so this idea of homeostasis is going to be one that's very closely tied to this idea of survival. Because you need to have this balance, you need the ability to maintain your body within a stable, uh, capable, okay range to allow you to survive. And so we are going to constantly control our internal body to make sure that we have the right amounts of sugars, the right temperature, the right amount of water. So if you drink a bunch of water, you urinate. If you don't drink much water, you don't urinate as much. That's your body controlling the amount of water in your body. If there's too much, you get rid of it. If there's too little, you try to keep it. And you'll also see some organisms will help control the external environment where you'll have a whole bunch of stuff like us that ultimately is going to take in CO2. So we'll just write us and make it a circle. Uh, and so you're going to have stuff where we are going to release CO2. That's something we breathe out. And we are going to need oxygen. And this works out well to keep the amount of CO2 and oxygen stable in the atmosphere, this idea of stability, because you also are going to have, and I'll just do one a little circle with plants in it, and plants are ultimately going to release O2, so that'd be an arrow going away from them because they're, they're getting rid of it, and then they're going to absorb or use CO2. And so you can see that the CO2 that we're getting rid of can essentially head on over to plants who need it, and the oxygen that plants are getting rid of can essentially head right over to animals like us, uh, which can then go ahead and take that and use it. And so by working together, we keep it where the atmosphere has about 21%, you don't have to memorize that, but about 21% oxygen. And that, by being stable, allows all of us to do a good job at surviving because we know what to expect. If the amount of oxygen dropped, it'd be a lot harder for us to get by. Uh, just think about what happens when you go up in elevation. People will talk about getting lightheaded and having issues because there's a little bit less oxygen there because the air is a little bit thinner. And so because there's less air period, if you will, there's a bit less oxygen. And so if we had a drop in this, if these things weren't stable in our environment, that would have a huge impact on the survival of us as well as many, many, many other species that also depend on that CO2, that oxygen, I mean all kinds of stuff that's in our external environment. So we do have where we control our internal selves, but we oftentimes too work with other organisms likely somewhat unintentionally, uh, to also help regulate the environment as a whole, the, the, the more broad environment. And then our last one here is going to be evolution, which we talked about briefly before. Uh, but the idea is just this is change over time, and it's going to happen because of natural selection, where certain characteristics, which are due to your genes, remember, we've got all this stuff tying together now. So if you've got genes like our uh, dashingly handsome fellow here, the star-nosed mole, it's got where it looks like it's got fingers coming out of its face. Uh, they're actually these very, very sensitive touch organs. Because they're underground, they burrow. You can also see, you can tell they burrow. They've got these big, giant front paws with nice claws so that they can dig through the ground. And then they use these little feelers that are up near their mouth, that, that star nose, which is basically just a gigantic, modified nose, if you will. They use that to, to tap everything. And they're doing it trying to look for worms and grubs and larvae and insects that are down there in the ground. And by tapping on them, they can quickly identify, is this food or not? And if it's food, they quick gobble it up. And if it's not food, they leave it be. So they don't really need good eyesight because they're subterranean. They're in the ground. Uh, what they really need is a better sense of smell to some degree. But in this case, touch is the really big thing. I mean, you've got normal smells of dirt and everything else, so for them, they're just going to kind of tap everything with that nose. And that's tapable in a ridiculously short amount of time of telling them if it's edible or not. So before something can kind of try to take off, boom, they've got it, they can eat it. So you can see these adaptations that they have, which are just things that help you survive in your environment. Uh, and so the moles that were born with stronger, better, 
claws, which would be genetically there. You're going to build these largely out of proteins. And so those of them who had the larger claws would be able to dig better, and so they survived and reproduced better. And so that would explain why we see in subtraining animals typically these bigger, larger paws. And then obviously the nose, individuals that can use this kind of modified touch nose are going to be able to find more prey, they're going to be able to get more food, and so that will allow them to survive, and that will allow them to have more sex, which will allow them to pass on the gene or genes that allow them to have that special touch sensitive nose that gave them an advantage to their offspring. So you'll see the evolutionary theory is very closely tied to the gene theory because those two together explain so much of why we see the types of changes that we do over time. You know, of why it is that uh, penguins and dolphins and fish all have fins when they swim in the water despite the fact that one's a fish, one's a bird, one's a mammal. They're not really connected or related to each other. They've just both kind of by being in the water over time been selected, been kind of pushed to have fins because the individuals that were kind of bullet shaped with fins could swim really well. It took less energy, they could swim faster, so they had an easier time escaping predators and catching prey, which means they survive better, which means they can have more sex and they can pass on those adaptations via their genes to their offspring. And the other bit we'll just make sure you bring up is the environment will change over time. So just keep in mind that an adaptation that's beneficial right now is not necessarily going to stay beneficial forever. It all depends upon that exact moment. So you might be really, really, really furry like the woolly mammoth, which is great for the ice age. But if it starts to get much more tropical over a couple hundred years, you're going to see that suddenly being woolly could be a huge, huge hindrance. It could be a problem. And so individuals that are less woolly would be selected. They'd be the good guys now, so to speak, because they're the ones that are best adapted for that particular current environment. And so this is why even species that might seem cool, like the woolly mammoth, uh, and there's obviously been lots of others, Bacillosaurus, a giant whale, things that you look at and you're just like, wow, that thing's awesome. There's no way it should go extinct. But if the environment changes and they don't have the proper adaptations, if they don't have the right genes present, to allow them to make it, they can go extinct. And it's not that they're like a horrible organism in general. They at that point are just not equipped to handle that specific environment. And if they can't and they die, then they go extinct and they're gone regardless of if the environment bounces back to where they would be top dog again. They're gone. And so this is why so many species can go extinct because of these environmental changes that occur over time. Uh, that if you give a species millions of years, there's a pretty good chance something's going to happen somewhere along the way uh, that can potentially make them go extinct. Uh, that, I believe, is it for our 1.5 section. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I will see you guys soon with the next podcast. Take it easy.